A very good evening to all of you guys. Hope you guys are doing well. Welcome to yet another virtual learning session in our 2024 advanced levels Econ Hub Theory Virtual Program. So as we as you guys are well aware, we are in the third chapter of Unit 1. And last week, we got ourselves a really good introduction into uh, what is an economic system and um, what are the different institutions that we bring together in order to create uh, the social institutional mechanism known as an economic system. And also we looked at what is the purpose of an institutional, sorry, what is the purpose of an economic system. So we'll get into them, we'll do a very quick recap, and then we'll go into the area we have to discuss today, which is classifying economic systems. How do we classify economic systems, identify different types of economic systems, right? Uh, before we get into that, uh, I want to take a few minutes and very quickly uh, discuss with you guys uh, on something important that happened in your life uh, last Friday, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, so what happened in last Friday? Right about uh, this time or maybe a few uh, minutes later, last Friday. Are you guys with me? Yes, you, you guys don't want to talk about it. Anyone? What happened last Friday? Ah, yes. The GCE Ordinary Level 2021 exam results were uh, released. So I'm sure, uh, I'm confident all of you guys have done uh, really well and got outstanding results. Okay. Uh, the way each of us Buta, look at our results, um, it's very uh, subjective, right? Uh, each of us have different expectations and um, how we look look at the examination and things like that. So I'm not, uh, I can't take the results of um, each of you and uh, try to uh, compare them. That is not uh, a proper thing to do. So... Uh, each of you guys uh, would have had some expectations on your results. And I am confident uh, that most of you guys, all of you guys, most of those expectations uh, have been fulfilled. Of course, uh, there's always a few um, uh, disappointments, you know, lower than expected outcomes here and there. That's a natural thing, but that's part of life, how things work. Now, um, what I want to talk about is now, first and foremost, again, yet again, congratulations to all of you guys on a job well done in uh, getting through your, uh, getting over and above your uh, ordinary level hurdle and clearing that, uh, you know, jumping over it and clearing that. And now you guys are uh, well and truly advanced level students. Okay. So that part is done. So yet again, congratulations on your results. Now, uh, how do we look at this? How do we go? How do we look at the future and how do we go forward? That's what I think uh, as your advanced level economics teacher, I should be talking about. Yes, right. Okay, a very simple message is what I'm trying to deliver. Um, as I said, your all level results will mean... Um, different things right uh, so there is a message from one of your friends that the uh, the video stream i think is lagging a bit uh, does anyone else have the problem is the stream lagging no right okay so but just uh, we'll see maybe something from your end hopefully it will be okay right as i was saying um there is um uh, each of us will look at, each of you guys will look at your results in a different way. There will be certain positives that you can take out of it. Definitely, there will be a lot of positive things you can take out of your ordinary level results. Uh, that will tell you certain things about your potential, your capabilities and things like that. 
also there might be certain things you have to um, use uh, that you might feel are certain disappointing things for you at the moment but puta look at them as an opportunity where you can identify them you you see that you have to improve in certain areas and work on them as well right so take all the positives from your o level experience from your o level results and uh, whatever the negative things maybe work on them convert them into your advantages right and now most importantly fully 100% commit and work towards right reaching your potential and uh, whatever happened in o levels in advance levels it can be really really a different outcome right it's a whole different thing whole new opportunity here when it comes to advanced levels why am i saying that uh, i have had students uh, sometimes who have got uh, 9a grade passes in o levels uh, but who have got through a levels with very very basic results sometimes who have come down in one or two subjects in advanced levels after doing o levels and i said i have had students which means this is after doing commerce stream subjects for uh, a levels not after doing bio or math stream subjects so but that 9 as is a really really outstanding achievement in o levels don't let me or anyone else take anything away from that amazing achievement if you have got 9 as or 8 uh, as or 7 as or if you have got a good number of a grade passes right tremendous brilliant achievement don't don't let anyone put it down but please understand uh that should give you a lot of confidence and that should give you the motivation to do even better in advanced levels or maintain that results in advanced levels and uh, get this done in a levels but when we become too complacent when we take that too much uh, as a confidence thing uh, then but we don't put that effort required the, the effort advanced level de demands from you and end of the day what happens is instead of growing on your instead of building upon your outstanding o level performance in a levels people go down so first thing for anyone who has got very very high uh, number of a grade passes and uh, 9a results my advice my guidance my sincere request from you is with a brilliant achievement but now your ambition should be your focus your motivation should be to maintain the same top level performance in advanced levels so you should start fresh and work towards that and bring all the de de determination and that um, grit or that perseverance you need to bring and get this done in a levels you have to reach you have to maintain your performance and you have to reach your potential in a levels on the other hand there might be some of you guys or there might be some students i have had students like that again this is through experience i'm sharing this with you guys um who have done uh in a very basic way in o levels so i've got through o levels in a very basic way i have had students who have not who do not have a single a grade pass a single b grade pass in their ordinary level result sheet for none of the subjects they have been able to get a a or a b in o levels but they have taken the challenge of advanced levels in a very very positive way in a very positive way and what they have done is they have looked at a levels right they have not allowed their o level results fully define them they have not allowed their o level results define who they are they have they have taken the advice given to them by people like right me and other teachers they have they have taken whatever the positive thing from o levels even though they have very basic o level performance they have put their heart and soul in the de determination the grit the perseverance everything that is demanded by a levels and they have worked well from the beginning they have followed the guidance stick with the pro they have stuck with the program okay the classes and they are now in the best top level national universities in sri lanka in the management faculties uh doing law in the law faculties doing their degrees 
after getting three A's and outstanding results in A levels, even though they had very basic results in very, very basic results in, in some cases, very basic results in O levels. So, but I, this can go either way. It's in your hands. Do not take everything from O levels, take all the motivation, take all the, uh, you know, the, the uh, positive things out of O levels, right? For the fourth time, congratulations, great job in O levels. Now, look at A levels and reach your potential and look at A levels as a whole new opportunity as a very different thing that you have to put again your full effort forward best foot forward and keep working and get this done right so i'm confident all of you got the message so um, let's look at this with that attitude buddha i as a teacher my teaching philosophy my teaching approach my whole uh, program theory or revision, anything that I do as an economics teacher for advanced level students, my only ambition is to give you all the knowledge, give you all the tools and the resources required to reach your potential. I believe each and every one of you within you, I am very confident in this, right? Each and every one of you guys within you have a tremendous potential and the ability to achieve an A grade pass, a top level A grade pass for this subject and for the other subjects that you guys are doing in A levels. That is what I am focused on and I will teach for that. Um, whether you guys know this or not, based on the number of years that I have been doing this job and based on the hundreds of thousands of students who have participated in the classes up to now, you guys know I said this several times before. In your first book, I just mentioned it also so that you get some confidence about the program. 2024, your batch is my 20th advanced level batch, 20th intake. So in all the batches before that, 2023 uh, is there. They are the 19th batch. Then 2022, they will do the exam very soon. They are the 18th batch. Then 17 batches before that, Buddha. 17 batches before that, many, many students right okay before this whole uh, the, the corona and the easter sunday and all these problems began right uh, numbers were diff different uh, and we didn't have virtual classes then physical classes so uh, hundreds of thousands of students right uh, i have seen them go through this process so i know uh, and if you look at the total number of A grade passes in all of those 17 batches, right? You are participating, you are listening to a person, you are, you are participating in a program, right? Without, without any doubt, has produced the highest number of aggregate or total A grade passes for this subject in English medium. So I think that is the most important thing that you can trust. Yes, and that is why you need to uh, trust me when I say, tell you guys that we teach uh, uh, the pro entire program that I conduct here, revision both, are for uh, A grade pass. And I believe each, of, each and every one of you guys are A grade material, A grade students. So let's get the job done. And um, yeah, so one more time. Congratulations. And one more time. Now, officially, <laughs> advanced levels has begun. You are now fully an advanced level student. Don't look back. Look forward and keep working. Okay? Right. All the best, Buddha. Let's get this done. Right. So here we go. Uh, a quick recap, right? And then we'll get into the area today that is classifying economic systems. All of you guys can... See what I've shared on the screen, our virtual whiteboard. Right, introduction to economics is the broad uh, way we title unit one. Okay, right. And in terms of that, in terms of introduction to economics, we are in the third chapter. And uh, last week, we did the introduction to economic systems. So let me quickly run through. First thing we want to do was, we want to define what an economic system is. I used the analogy or an example that the word system comes from biological science. And I said, our body is a combination of different systems. 
each system has different components connected to it and each system has a function or purpose the components of an economic system and in, in our body we have biological systems uh, in economics we have social systems society has created these systems not nature or biology so society has created so we have a social system called an economic system each system has different components. Components in an economic system are called institutions. Institutions. And the purpose of the different biological systems we have in our body, each has a certain purpose given, right? Our uh, uh, respiratory system, the purpose is to take oxygen in to the respiratory tract and then bring it to the lungs, mix it with our blood, and send enough oxygen to all the different organs we have in our body. Similarly, uh, each system has a purpose or a function. The purpose or the function of an economic system is to solve our basic economic problems by allocating our scarce resources. So we defined an economic system. We said an economic system is a social and institutional mechanism a method is there, mechanism, organization, created for the purpose of allocating the scarce resources of a society and solving the society's basic economic problems. We identified the basic economic problems as well in terms of what to produce, how to produce, and whom to produce. Then uh, we, we knew there were different ways to define an economic system. So we looked at one alternative definition and we said, yes, in each of our body, we have different systems. All of them are common. Every person has a respiratory system. Every person has a blood circulation system. Every person has a digestive system, central nervous system. But all of us, all of our personalities are not the same. Similarly, all economic systems have the same institutions, but the way those institutions are structured, the way they work will not be the same because those institutions work within different um, frameworks. There's a certain framework that we create. Within that framework, these institutions work. Uh, basically, Buddha, if you think of individual people, their personalities are different. Likewise, each economic system, each economic system has three things that are unique to that economic system. Three things that are unique to that economic system. What are they? Each economic system has a legal structure unique to that economic system. Each economic system has a incentives structure, what motivates us, incentive structure, unique or special to that economic system, that country, that society. Each economic system has a structure of traditions, customs, cultural values unique to that economic system. So these three things we combine and we create something called a, a framework within which the institutions work and this mechanism happens and we solve our basic economic problems. Last week, I told you guys very clearly, when you define, right? Um, right, last week, I told you guys very clearly, when you define an economic system, right? When you define an economic system, please make sure that uh, you use both of these components, one and two, right? When you define an economic system, right? Then, all economic systems are trying to solve uh, three basic economic problems by making three decisions. So the three basic economic problems are what to produce in what quantity, which is an allocation problem. To solve this problem, problems can only be solved by making decisions. So to solve this problem, we make a production decision. Yes. And then... Um, how to produce is a production problem. To solve this problem, we make a choice of techniques decision. And we have the problem of whom to produce, which is a distribution problem. To solve this, we have to make a distribution decision. So this is where we talked about the cake analogy, the cake example, where we learned every economic system has to make a cake. But what kind of a cake is to be made? The economic system has to decide. Every country has to decide. So that is what to produce. Then uh, how to make the cake, right? Some economies can decide, some societies can decide to make the cake, manually mix everything by hand. Some economic systems can decide to use machines to mix everything when they make the cake. So whether to use more capital, more labor, how to produce. 
what to produce, what kind of a cake to produce, how to produce, how to make the cake, and whom to produce is once we have made the cake, we have to decide how to cut the cake, how to divide the cake, and who gets how much of the cake, what kind of a piece of the cake, slice of the cake. Get it? What to produce, how to produce, and whom to produce. The cake is goods and services. Right. Um, institutional components, because in the definition, we said the economic system is an institutional uh, mechanism. So what are the main institutions we see within an economic system? So we completed a table last week, right? I'll quickly share this. Um, you guys will remember then. So yeah, we completed uh, this particular table in page number 42, put up, right? The institutional structure within every economic system. We have to learn about five, six main institutions. We are very clear on them, households, Enterprises, government, remember, households, enterprises, government. Then we talked about markets, very important institution. Then we talked about labor organizations and non-government organizations. These are the main institutions we see within any economic system of the world, within any economic system of the world. Then Buddha, we talk about the other institutional structures are there. Every economic system has certain other institutional structures that was the framework that we talked about remember the framework uh, so the three components the three structures uh, that make the framework within which the institutions function operate right all the institutions are connected to each other they are working they are interacting with each other that is the households the uh, enterprises the government markets labor organizations ngos all of these institutions are connected. They are interacting. They are making decisions. But all this happens with a, within a certain frame. Right? Like you guys can see me inside a box within a frame. Right? There is a framework within which only these, only within which those institutions are operating. That mechanism is created to solve, make decisions and to make the production decision, choice of techniques decision, distribution decision, and the basic economic problems are solved by allocating scarce resources. To do all that, there is a framework we talk about. That framework is made of three things. What are they? Three structures. Legal structure, incentive structure, and a structure of traditions, customs, and cultural values. That's how we create the framework. Within that, the institutions operate. Right. When institutions operate within this framework, we can see certain features. In every economic system, we see features such as there is a certain uh, way in which resources are owned and uh, the rights of using those resources are created. Resource ownership is one feature that we see. Got it? So um, I'll go back to the slides. Right. So then the three things we talked about. Right. And um, the nature of resource ownership. So within this institutional uh, framework is uh, structure that we call the economic system but the, we see in every economic system there's a certain uh, way we can identify resource ownership is taking place nature of resource ownership then um, the resource allocation mechanism how are they allocating the resources and how are they really solving the basic economic problems then in every economic system we see there's a certain structure of incentives is also there. There are things that motivate people in an economic system. The point is with the, especially the first three is important. Uh, in every economic system, there's a way of, way in which, the nature meaning that the way in which something happens. There's a certain uh, way in which uh, resource ownership is taking place. But so in every economic system, resource ownership is there. But from one economic system to another, uh, the way the resource ownership is taking place, whether it's a private sector, public sector is owning resources, that can change from one economic system to another. So that is why these institutional features, these uh, mainly the first three points and altogether the five points we have written here, really, really help us understand how an economic system is operating, how an economic system is operating. Right.
So uh, how an economic system is classified operating. I'll explain this a bit more, right? You guys will understand. For now, the only thing I wanted from last week's learning is for you guys to know solidly that there are five institutional features within every economic system. So as long as you can remember the five for now, we are okay, right? Then uh, number four, we looked at the nature of income redistribution and the social safety networks and then politics and ideology, politics and ideologies, okay? Right, first three are critical. First three are very, very uh, important, okay? The first three are very, very important, okay? Uh, especially the first two, that's tested a lot, especially the more than anything, right? More than anything, the second one is tested a lot in your exam, okay? Right, we'll learn, but that's what we are about to do today. Right, so we can use these things to identify, classify different economic systems. Then uh, very briefly, I explained to you guys the evolutionary process of economic systems, how we have got to the different economic systems we have today. Right. Okay. So let's start today's area, classifying economic systems, classifying economic systems. So basically, Buta, why do we look at a certain country and say this country is a capitalist economy? Or why do we look at another country and say socialist economy? Why do we look at a country and say market economy? Command economy, mixed economy. Get it? How do we make that decision? How do we classify, categorize, categorize different economic systems? That's what we are about to learn. Uh, one of the most tested things in the exam, the most tested areas in the exam is what we are about to start learning now. So if I was you, right, since you guys are very focused, very, you know, Determine students to learn everything to go for that high-end A-grade pass, right? Which we are working towards. So, Buta, make make sure you are very, you are really concentrating now and put your full effort and get this done. Get it? Right. It's a very important area. Number one. Now, these numbers continue from the earlier thing in the chart, right? In the table that you completed in your study material. These numbers are what I'm completing, continuing in the next page here, right? But let me first explain this to you. Then I'll give you some time, complete the table. Don't rush to complete in the table without understanding what you're writing. Okay, right. Be patient. Okay, be patient. Just let's discuss this table first and then you can start completing it. Is that clear, Buddha? Because otherwise, I don't want you to get distracted even for the purpose of writing the note. Do not get distracted. Really get this into your head. Right. I'll, I'll be very practical with this explanation. Okay. As I said, highly tested in the exam. Right. So let's look at this. Um, temporarily, if you can, right, uh, your hard copy of the study material that you guys have, just close it. Keep it, a, keep it just on the side and concentrate on what we are discussing. Later on, then the temptation you have to quickly write it down is not there. If the material is closed for a moment. Okay. Don't close it and throw it away. Close it and keep it aside. Right? Okay. Here we go. Ownership of resources. A small thing I just want to quickly be clear on is uh, later on you can, when you write the note, you can make a note of this later on. Right? When we say um, resources, we are mainly talking about property resources, property resources. When we say property resources, because we have done factors of production now, what really comes to our mind is there are three types of property resources, but the three types of properties are there. But um, mainly what should come to our mind always is, right? Okay, basically, Buddha, you have learned this land and capital, right? Land and capital. Those are the main property resources because labor and entrepreneurship were identified as, labor and entrepreneurship were identified as, yes, very good. You guys are responding, brilliant. Uh, was identified as human resources. So land and capital is what we identify as property resources, both land and capital, okay? Property resources, right? 
So when we are looking at the nature of resource ownership within an economic system, we are looking at, right, the land and capital. We are mainly looking at land and capital ownership, right? Who owns the who owns majority of the land and capital resources of this country? Depending on that, there's always ownership is there, Buddha. So depending on that we can really start talking about two main types of economic systems. Two main types of economic systems. So, uh, And when we talk about ownership, there are only two main parties, right? When we complete this, you will see. Right. If there is an economic system, if there is a country where the dominant ownership is, right? I'll just make a note here. Uh, right. Do dominant private right you guys can write the full full thing later on when you write private property ownership right if there is dominant private property ownership keyword private sector private sector dominates or majority of the land and capital property resources in a country are owned and controlled by the private sector. That means we are in a capitalist economy and or we are in a liberal economy. Liberal meaning free. The private sector owns resources. They have the freedom to do what they want with it. Capitalist or liberal. But you have to be very careful. We only use the words capitalist or liberal economic system when we look at ownership of resources. Ownership of resources. Right. Then um, uh, what about socialist or communist economic system? Who has the dominant property ownership? If the dominant, right, that is a good word, dominant, the majority, domination, dominant, uh, public, Yes, I'm getting some responses. Brilliant. Yes, very good. Right? Uh, Shihla, very good. Uh, dominant, public. Okay? Public or sometimes we say state. You can say government also. State, public. These are common terms we use for the government. Public or state. Right? Um, Yeah, uh, message is received, uh, Khadija, right? Uh, if it is a risk like that, you can leave the, make sure eventually you watch the recorded version at least once it's uploaded, okay? Right. Uh, dominant, okay? Dominant, uh, public or state, state, uh, right? Property. ownership dominant state or public property ownership. if the government mainly owns controls majority of the land and capital i.e the property resources then buddha you are in a socialist or a communist uh, system a country now if you take real world examples uh, countries like uh, usa countries like canada Countries like uh, UK, right, are generally good examples for countries which are uh, capitalist systems. Okay. Now, USA can be identified a market economy. That's a different classification. Okay. Same country can be a capitalist country and a market economy as well. That's okay. But when we say ownership of property resources, but other words we use are capitalist socialist or liberal communist. Get it? Right. So USA, uh, then uh, UK, Canada, these are examples for countries that are mostly um, capitalist countries. They're capitalist-driven countries. Then uh, if you take one of the ideal examples for a socialist or communist system, almost a pure communist system if you have in the world, that is today, uh, yes, what is a good example? Uh, Russia, yes, Russia is more of a socialist, communist-based country. But uh, there's another country, Buddha, which is 
which is uh, still following um, you know the karl marx uh, communist manifesto uh, to the uh, letter almost right what is that country yes hasini you are very correct yes uh shehla it's also correct china is also a communist country a red economy but uh, a neighbor of china is more of a com pure communist country pure communist to understand the communist system they are really good to look at as an example yes shehla very correct yes nuha very correct yes there we go now you guys are getting the idea the countries yes uh deep to china is a communist country right we are trying to talk about one of the most communist countries in the world pure communism is there perfectly communist country so that we can understand the system a bit yes shehla very good right so i think we are okay yes most of you guys have got this uh north korea the land of the kims north korea and if you talk Uh, very quickly very briefly about north korea right uh, their system right uh, now <clears throat> if you um, actually but if you want to we can do a really nice comparison we can take uh, north korea and south korea south korea is a capitalist country right so uh, south korea is a capitalist country north korea is a <laughs> north korea is a so a communist country south korea is a very much capitalist country right where there is considerable uh, private property ownership there is a government of course but uh, property ownership is mainly with the private sector in north uh, south korea right um, and uh, it's, it's a tr thriving capitalist country uh there is considerable amount of liberty freedom given to the people they do have their rules regulations every country does but uh what you want to do with your property you know how you invest your money where do you go and work and how do you earn an income and how do you spend your income and what kind of a living standard you want to maintain all that you have the freedom to decide Liber liberties are there south korea if you to get that there north korea they are northern neighbor north korea same country right we have divided into two after the korean war so if you look at the north korea if you look at north korea completely different they are a socialist based highly communist based system in north korea but 95% of all the property resources 95% of all the uh, on almost 100% of the property resources 95% of the production activity everything is government based government is doing because they own the property resources almost 100% of property ownership in north korea is with the uh, government north korea is with the government now for example the difference is uh, i'll take two quick examples we'll say uh, you are living in south korea right and uh, uh, you live in a small house in, in a house right uh, which can be owned by you Uh, in south korea capitalist country private property ownership so uh, in the backyard you have a jack tree i don't know whether they have jack trees there in the backyard there is a jack tree uh, in your house in your backyard garden right uh, and this jack tree is uh, really uh, becoming uh, where you know it, it is shedding a lot of leaves and the gutters in the roof are getting blocked and it's a big thing to maintain so you decide to cut a few branches or cut the jack tree because it's a bit of a nuisance for you now right so what you do is you decide on a on a given sunday you know family members get together or you hire someone and you cut the tree or cut the branches of the tree no problem no one will have any issue because it's your own house it's your own backyard it's your own jack tree right uh, if the government has a small regulation where you have to get a a uh, sort of a permit or something like that you can unless you are planning to put a cut and uh, sell the br branches or you know do something like that uh, you don't need to even do that you can just cut it and uh, get your thing done is that clear right because it's a it's your property private property ownership now if someone does the same thing exact same thing in 
North Korea, this communist country, the moment you cut the tree, even if you cut one branch, or if you cut the tree, for God forbid, right? Most probably within a matter of hours, the police will arrive and you will be arrested. And the offense you did is, even though the tree is in your own backyard, the offense you did is you destroyed public property. You destroyed public property. Where is this tree? In your own backyard. We are in North Korea. Communist system. Why? Because your house, your backyard, the jack tree in your backyard doesn't belong to you. Property resources are owned by the government. You don't have the right to cut down government's jack tree. You're only just living in that house, occupying the garden. Nothing belongs to you. That's the North Korean system or the, the communist system rather. The pure communist system is there. Everything is owned by the state. The state controls things. Is that clear? That's one example. The other example is we'll say um, you are a, a, a you know a school leaver. You've just passed out from high school uh, in Sri Lanka, the A-level equivalent. You've completed your high school you know, diploma and whatever it is. Now you are trying to think of a career. You are a young person in uh, North Korea. And you are a young person, yeah, you're a young person in North Korea. Now, if you are if you are the same person in South Korea, right, you have endless uh, options, you have different fields to choose from, different careers to choose from. You know, it's purely up to you, right? If you don't want to go and uh, work, if you just want to go and uh, we'll say do something uh, else, uh, like become a uh, you know, actor, you know, in uh, K something drama, if you want to become a singer in K something, you know, if you want to pop as a singer, you know, whatever you can do, you have the freedom. You can be a YouTube personality, you can uh, become a lawyer, doctor, engineer, whatever you want, that's up to you. Okay? South Korea, capitalist system is that, freedom is there, liberties are there. If you're in North Korea, most probably after you finish your high school diploma, whatever it is that is equal to A-levels in Sri Lanka, and when you wait at home, right, if you've got through, got the results, everything, right, uh, you will most probably get a letter from the government saying, congratulations on getting your, getting through your exams. Uh, you, will, you have been assigned by the government to work in this particular uh, government farm or government uh, factory. Please report to work with your belongings on this particular date. And you have to go on that date. You don't decide what you do. Government tells you what you're going to do. What, what is the job you're going to do? Each person is given a job in the system, in the plan they have. So if you uh, are unhappy about it, you can write an appeal to the government saying, no, 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 government, I don't want to work in the farm. I don't like agriculture. I like to sing. I want to become a singer. Government, you can send an appeal. They will most probably they will reply by saying, uh, "We are very happy to hear that you are talented and you want to sing, uh, but you need to report to the farm and uh, start working. If not, you will be held contempt of the government uh, rule. Then you will be sent to another. You know, you'll be arrested, and again you'll have to go through a big process because you didn't follow the rules. Uh, maybe the letter could. <laughs> maybe the letter could say." Uh, go to the farm while working in the farm you can sing all you want but you have to go to the farm because that is how the system works now you might be thinking my god what kind of torture is this communist or socialist system if everything is decided by the government the thing about the socialist or communist system is with the uh, everyone is equally treated the community is considered the society is con considered as one community and everything is equal to everyone you might be a doctor you might be a lawyer you might be a, a basic uh, clerical worker in the government uh, department. You might be a person who clear, clears garbage on the street. That doesn't matter. Most probably you will have kind of an equal or similar living standard. That's the North Korean system. Or that's a communist system rather, socialist system. So that is the attractiveness about that system. Everyone is equal. Capitalist system, the attractiveness is it's a freedom. The liberties are there. But the downside of the capitalist system is it's a very, very uh, highly competitive, highly um, uh, greed-based 
system where you have to be very very smart you have to be very very uh, good with uh, you know uh, whatever you do you have to be the best then only you can uh, only then you can really survive in a capitalist system and reach the top in a capitalist system the thing is there will be major disparities there will be major gap between the uh, haves and the have nots or the rich and the poor that gap is there in the capitalist system so this is capitalism and socialism any questions we are not going to talk about this again because your exam really focuses on remember but i had a star earlier where it said number two mechanism of resource allocation i said that's what is mainly tested from you so this you need to have a basic idea okay right that doesn't mean you can afford not to know this you have to know this right but what is tested a lot in the second paper especially is uh, how do we classify systems based on mechanism of resource allocation don't write i didn't still ask you guys to write don't worry i'll give you the time right then we have based on the mechanism of resource allocation we identify three main economic systems we have traditional economic systems now but when we say mechanism of resource allocation right mechanism of resource allocation uh, remember there is another way this is said sometimes in the exam question the examiner will say uh, i'll write it here okay you can i just had the star you can write it somewhere when you not now when you write the note uh, basically the examiner will say uh, based on the method okay based on the method of solving basic economic problems based on the method of solving basic economic problems if the question is asking how do we classify economic system same story there is also mechanism of resource allocation mechanism of okay uh, there's a bit of a problem again i think some of you all are having with the video stream lagging maybe because of the weather or whatever it is okay i'll, I'll uh, turn off the video for a bit right let's see if it improves okay i haven't got any message putta from my end uh, i mean from the anything about the internet or whatever it is from my end but uh, yeah let's try this okay right so um, based on the mechanism of resource allocation how do we classify economic systems mainly we identify right uh mainly we identify basically um yeah mainly we identify basically three main economic system traditional system price mechanism then planning mechanism right three main economic systems and um okay uh, based on this uh actually now i have given the mechanism but economic system is market economic system traditional economic system command or centrally planned economic system right then sometimes we say indicative planning system it's not a separate economic system but it's one way one way the planning mechanism is used so uh, price mechanism is mostly used by um, countries where private property ownership is there where market demand and supply price of goods and services factors of production decide uh, how to solve the problems of what to produce whom to produce and uh, so what to produce how to produce and whom to produce traditional system is as the word itself says but the we solve basic economic problem based on traditions right then uh, we have the planning mechanism where the economy will depend on uh, medium and long term economic plans that are prepared right and those plans will explain uh, how to solve the basic economic problems so uh, it's not always the case but generally we see uh, a relationship where most capitalist based countries tend to follow the market uh, price mechanism so market system most socialist based countries tend to follow the planning mechanism or the planning system again please make sure 
these things are studied, understood separately. That's why they are in two different columns. Don't mix them up with that. In the exam, if they ask you a question, how do we classify economic system based on mechanism of resource allocation? How economic systems are classified based on mechanism of resource allocation? Then if you go and write, okay, if you go and write words like capitalist, socialist, you will um, not get marks with that. Even if you write all the other things correctly, if you have mentioned words like capitalism, socialism, when the basis is mechanism of resource allocation or method of solving basic economic problems, you will not get marks. The entire question, you will lose the marks. So be very clear when to use which words. Is that clear? Be very clear on how to use these words. Please don't mix it up. Got it? Hopefully you are uh, clear on this. Right? Um, right. So that's the idea there. And then um, uh, mixed economic systems. Now, mixed economy, most common way, right? The most common way this uh, mix can, yeah, I think we are okay. The most common way this mix can happen is you will have, um, right? The most common way this mix can happen is you will have a... Uh, mixture of the price mechanism and the planning mechanism get it that's the more common mix because for the when you say capitalist socialist not that they don't mix but they are very difficult to have at the same time capitalism and socialism is like uh, oil and water very difficult to mix there are very strong ideologies. Now, if you go to a country like USA, there was a time Buddha in USA, which we know is a capitalist country. We talked about it. There was a time in USA, you can be sent to prison. You will be arrested and sent to prison for being a, a person who, uh, you know, learns, talks about, or shows some kind of a... Uh, likingness towards communism. They call you a commie or a communist guy and they will arrest you and send you to prison because they think even thinking about communism is against their capitalist values. So that level of ideological, ideological difference is there between capitalism and socialism. Now Russia, even today, Anything, if anything USA does, they will always label it as this capitalist, you know, Western capitalist, and they will start with that. In Russia, they, be, they are all about socialism. So, yes, there can be mixed economic systems where there is a mix of capitalism and socialism, but the more common way mixed economic systems are created, the more practical way, re real world situation is um, the mix of price mechanism and planning mechanism, right? Um, and uh, today we believe almost all the countries in the world with a very few exceptions, such as North Korea, right? To a certain extent, Cuba, and maybe, yeah, mainly those two countries is what comes to mind uh, at the moment uh, with the exceptions of North Korea and Cuba. Most of the other countries in the world today are very much very much mixed economic systems, right? They are either more towards the market side of the mix or more towards the planning side of the mix. Today, Buddha, most countries are leaning towards, going towards the uh, market side of having a mixed economic system. What is Sri Lanka? What is Sri Lanka? So I said most countries, apart from countries like North and uh, North Korea and uh, Cuba, are uh, mixed, eco uh, mixed economic systems. No? So what is Sri Lanka? Hmm? What do you guys think is Sri Lanka? What kind of, a, yes, what kind of a mix? I said either we go more towards the market side or more towards the planning side. No? Most countries go towards the market side. Uh, Sri Lanka is a mixed economic system, yes, obviously, 
right? We are a mixed economic system. No, no questions there. What kind of a mixed economic system? Look at the mixed economic systems that we have here. Socialist market economic system, social market economic system, then indicative planning system. Right? There is an argument that Sri Lanka is an indicative planning system. But the thing is, with the indicative planning is mostly used by uh, more capitalist-based countries. Now, look at Sri Lanka. What is the full name of Sri Lanka? What is the full name of Sri Lanka? Because we and Sri Lanka are very close friends. We just say Sri Lanka. No? Like you, you don't call your friends always uh, by their full name. No? You just call them by their given name. You know, the name that you're familiar with. Right? Uh, likewise, we look at Sri Lanka, we say Sri Lanka. No? Our guy, Sri Lanka. Yeah. <laughs> right? What is the full name? What is the name in Sri Lanka's birth certificate? Full name. Ah, there we go. Shikla has given us an answer which is correct. Okay. Anyone else? The full name. If you have a passport, don't go and look for it now. But if you have a passport, it's there. Right? Sri Lanka's full name. You should know. And you should know why we call it that. Here, in the passport, I just have it here, right? It says, okay, um, Sri Lanka Padatantrika Samajavadi Janaraja. And it's in all three languages. Uh, I'm not going to read it in Tamil. I can't read Tamil. Uh, Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka. Democratic we are a democratic country. Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka. Republic, we are an independent country. Right? Socialist Republic. The word is there. Sri Lanka is going with the ownership of resources, or going with that ideology. Sri Lanka is a socialist country. Sri Lanka is a what country? Socialist country. But we are a mixed economy. So we are a socialist country by definition. That's okay. No problem. What kind of a mixed economy are we? I said the mix is mainly the price and the planning. Sri Lanka is put the, here. At the moment, Sri Lanka is a socialist market economic system. Actually, based on our present president and the government and for a few years actually, Sri Lanka is trying to become, Sri Lanka is trying to become from a socialist market economy to a social market economic system. Sri Lanka is trying to go from a socialist market economic system to a social market economic system. Small difference, three letters, the IST, social market economic system, socialist market economic system. But there's a big difference between the two. Right? So with that, Sri Lanka still still we can still remain a socialist country, but our our economic system will focus more on being a very efficient market economy. At the same time, our economic system will focus more on social equity, social well well being of the people, and we will talk about the social market economic system later, right? But just keep that in mind. Uh, yeah, right and. Um, uh, that's how we look at a mixed economic model as well. So I've covered both boxes there with the mixed, mixed mechanism. But remember, more commonly, the mix is always between price mechanism, planning mechanism. We go, a country is either capitalist or socialist, but it's very difficult to say a country is uh, both capitalist and socialist. I've given some uh, uh, models like that for you to read, but uh, mainly that is how the mixed economic system works. Then, ladies and gentlemen, incentive system, right? Incentive system. So here we talk about material incentives, coercive incentives, and moral incentives. Material, coercive, and moral. I will explain these three types of incentives a bit later. For now, but uh, based on material and coercive, we can have two economic systems we can identify. But remember, uh, what we are saying is, in a country, if material incentives are more, the word I used earlier, uh, if material in incentives are more, uh, the word is dominant. Right? That doesn't mean, Buddha, 
they don't have coercive they have coercive incentives but what is more dominant more powerful material incentives then market economic system right uh, if a country has more dominant right dominant coercive incentive they have material but what is more dominant more powerful is coercive then we say command economic system moral incentives we don't we can't say uh, only market economic systems or only command economic systems have um, moral incentives and you can't say in one it's more than the other because moral incentives are there in all economic systems you don't classify based on that but material coercive depending on which is dominant we can identify market economic systems and uh, command economic systems so market system is based on price mechanism remember where we talk about demand supply deciding prices and price helping us uh, by performing certain functions we will learn with us solve basic economic problems command system i said it's about preparing medium and long term plans the word command comes from that authority we give to the government in a command system to make decisions on behalf of us make decisions on behalf of us right um, yeah that's how we classify economic systems keep this separate know the basis ownership of resources capital is socialist mechanism of resource allocation traditional market and command then uh, mixed economic systems are there for both but mainly the mix is the mechanism of resource allocation based then incentive can be used material incentives are dominant in market economic systems coercive incentives are dominant within command economic systems so i'm going to give you guys a good uh three four minutes i think that's enough to get this done okay right complete this table and let me know soon as you're done right
Okay, done. Everything complete, completed. Now, uh, some of your friends who are uh, participating in the Econ Hub physical classes, uh, in their note, uh, sometimes you guys might meet them in school and things like that, right? Uh, in their note, um, they might have this uh, mechanism of resource allocation that the middle column uh, might be in a different order, right? They might say market economic system and under that price mechanism, command economic system, uh, and then, uh, yeah, command economic system, then under that uh, planning mechanism can be given that, right? So, uh, sorry, indicative planning and then planning mechanism. So either way, it's okay, but we have to be clear that um, uh, if the mechanism is price mechanism, market system, mechanism is planning mechanism, command or centrally planning, central planning system. If not, sometimes we have an indicative planning. We learn these things, right? Okay. And uh, also, uh, just to be clear, um, any of your schoolmates and friends who have now got their, all of you have got your results now, we talked about it. Uh, if they are planning to do commerce in English medium, if they are doing economics as a subject, then uh, they need to, uh, if they are interested in joining um, uh, the program that has produced the highest number of A grade passes in total up to now, uh, if they are planning to join a program that is uh, very much focused on delivering a superior product that will ensure you get an A grade pass in the exam, if you follow the program with commitment from the beginning, uh, then Buddha, they need to join these classes at least from next Friday. Uh, if they are looking for a virtual session, if they are looking for physical classes, uh, you guys can give them our number. The, not triple seven hotline number, they can call and get all the information. If they're looking for a virtual class, uh, now you guys know how we conduct classes and the format and everything, Buddha. You need to encourage them to join soon as possible. Later on, uh, most probably in January, uh, I will discuss a proper plan. We will look at the students who are joining newly and we will have a discussion with them, a session with them. Right, I can have a Zoom session with them and I will explain to them anyone joining today, next Friday, throughout the month of December, we will keep in touch with them and give them the assurance. The you, you guys also can give them the assurance and the confidence with that, that whatever they have missed, they don't have to worry, but they have to join the classes as soon as possible because the more they wait, the more they miss. And then they might be thinking, can't we join a new batch? You know, isn't sir starting a new batch? Something like that. Um, because with that, we don't need to start a new batch. Then they will be behind six months behind you guys. Why should we do that? They can join your class because we are going to have a proper separate cover-up class program for them. It's not just asking them to watch the videos, recorded version. But a separate, a fast track cover up will be done for them. That's what we are doing. We plan, plan to start in January. Once everyone has settled in, we will have a separate set of classes, virtual or physical. Either way, we'll do accordingly. We will discuss with them. So give them the assurance that Sir said that uh, whatever you guys have missed will be properly covered up, but you need to join the ongoing class soon as possible. Otherwise, if we start from the very beginning as a separate batch, you guys will be five, six months behind uh, us, right? Uh, and that will be uh, too much of a gap. Putta. So be a good friend. <laughs> Encourage your friends to make the right decision and make the right decision at the right time. In this case, ASAP as soon as possible, right? So any further details you can get from the coordinator, you should be okay. Right, now with this, we move on and start talking about, uh, this is a very basic thing, Buddha, because we talked about property. I wanted to be clear on three things. 
uh, two things um, basically types of property resources and types of property rights it's a very simple thing there are three types of property resources we talk about but broadly what did i say when you think of property resources think about land and capital that's okay so the broad types of property resources we talk about are real property that is land physical capital machinery equipment vehicles things like that physical right stuff real property financial assets or property right the different financial assets the share market investments the 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 loans the debentures the bonds treasury bills all those things financial investments money basically then intellectual property intellectual property where we talk about things like you know uh, new inventions new technologies copyrights patent licenses royalties things like that intellectual property right so there are three types of property real property financial property intellectual property intellectual property is very common as ip intellectual property ip right okay then there are three types of property rights very simple stuff with us so let's not take too much time three types of property rights we talk about right what are these three types of property rights controlling rights cash flow rights and in um <laughs> controlling rights cash flow rights and uh, here the third one is this is wrong obviously the third one is we talk about right not intellectual property again we talk about disposal right make that adjustment i think the print is oh, ah you guys have to write this is it or if it's given printed, then you need to uh, do the adjustment quickly. Yeah, yes, you have to write it. So the three types of property rights are controlling rights, cash flow rights, and you have disposal rights. Disposal rights. Okay, disposal rights disposal right so controlling rights is for the the right to uh, control or to use the property right now if you are if you rent a house you get the controlling rights no as long as you are paying the rent right you can live in that house you can decide uh, which room who is going to get you can decide how you are going to arrange your furniture within the house you have the right you can even control who comes into the house and goes out of the house uh, even the owner of the house, the landlord can't come into the house. If you have taken it on rent, even the owner of the house cannot come into the house without your permission because you have the controlling rights. Because you have rented, legally you have rented. Controlling rights. I'll use that example, right, to explain this. Cash flow rights. Now, when you have rented a house, right, if you're on rent, you don't have the right to give a part of the house or the entire house on rent to someone else and earn an income from that. There's a system called subletting that you can do with the understanding of the owner. If not, Buddha, you can't rent a house saying it's for your use. And then uh, the different rooms in the house, you can't rent it to other people and earn, get more from them and then pay the rent and have a profit also. Because you, you can't, cash flow rights meaning the right to earn an income from the property. Now, on the other hand, if you lease a piece of land if you lease a coconut estate if you have taken a coconut estate for a, a 10 year lease long term 10 year lease then Buddha, during that 10 years you get the controlling rights and you get the cash flow rights you can earn from the property then disposal rights what are the disposal rights disposal rights is right to sell the property right to change the ownership of the property now if you have taken a house on rent obviously you don't get cash flow rights. You don't definitely. You don't get. You do not get disposal rights. You can't sell other another person's house no, if you're on rent, right? If you want disposal rights, even the coconut estate, but you can't sell. You have leased it. If you want disposal rights, in other words, if you want all three rights, if you want full rights for a property, you need to be the absolute owner of that property. If you are the absolute owner of the property, you get the full rights. Why did we talk about this? In a capitalist system, the private sector for land and capital have 
the full set of rights, meaning controlling cash flow disposal. In a socialist or communist system, the public sector or the government has the full set of rights for land and property, controlling cash flow and disposal. That's the meaning of the term property rights. There are three types of rights and you get them at different levels. If you want all three rights, you have to be the absolute owner of that property, absolute owner of the property. Got it? Yes or no? Clear or not? Quickly. Yes, sir. Right. Now you guys have an idea about property and property rights. Okay. Right. Mainly remember property resources are land and capital, but there are three things we can classify. Right. Good for you. Then we move on to start a discussion now with the, in your exam, the middle column. The middle column is absolutely critical. I hope and pray all of you guys wrote down that part where I had the star. Mechanism of resource allocation in the exam. There are enough past paper questions where they have asked based on the method of solving basic economic problems. How do you classify economic systems? They are what are the taboo words? The words we should never use there in that question. Capitalist, socialist. Don't use those words. We say market economic system, command economic system, traditional economic system, right? Those three, even indicative planning is not required. Mixed is also, it's not wrong to write, but don't write. Three things, traditional market command economic system, right? That middle column is the main thing that is tested. We have to go into detail. Capitalist socialist, we had an idea, that's enough. But we have to go into detail and learn about a market economic system, a pure market economic system, how does it work? A command economic system, how does it work? Then we will automatically understand with a mixed system how it works. Because once you have an idea about market and command. Got it? Right. So first we start middle column. First we start with traditional economic system. So these are given in your study material, printed and given. So I'll just quickly go through them. It's a very basic thing. Uh, today in the world, Buddha, we don't have any country that is following uh, a traditional economic system. Uh, we have certain tribal groups or ethnic groups within the country that might still try to maintain a bit of a traditional economic system because the thing in a traditional economic system is yes they solve basic economic problems based on traditions and generational uh, ancestral values and things like that with but uh, in a very important thing in a traditional system is it is a very primitive system where uh, people in the barter, people still in, in a traditional system, we use the barter system. But today, uh, almost every country in the world is in a monetary system. What is a monetary system? Where money is used as a medium of exchange. Money is used as a medium of exchange. So therefore, today we don't find any modern economy, which is a traditional economy. Right? Okay. Production factors, especially land is maintained as a common resource. Right, uh, it's not individually owned. Right, land is commonly owned, and they share the land. Uh, use a part of the land for their, you know, to build houses and to for the habitats and uh, habitat. Then they use a part of the land for agricultural activities, part of the land for herding cattle, whatever. Not get what I'm saying. So their land is their main resource, but it's commonly owned, collectively owned. Right, then. Um, so that's one thing, right, okay. And then uh, trade is based on the exchange of goods. Trade is based on the exchange of goods, barter system. Remember I said, so there is no use of money. We, they don't use money in a traditional system. It's about exchanging goods for goods, goods for services, barter system, very basic. Um, basic resource allocation decisions are solely, solely meaning only, made by leaders of the tribe, leaders, right, of the tribe. But they're the ones who will know the traditions well. Yes, the more senior members of the tribe or a high council comprising of senior members of the ethnic group based on uh, established ethnic and social traditions, ethnic and social traditions. That's what they use to solve basic economic problems. Uh, a further note I have given, kings, queens, traditional tribal leaders, religious leaders, Act as the members of this decision-making unit and provide the necessary leadership. Uh, in, in a traditional system, it's always based on seniority, Buddha. 
uh, young are not given that much of an important uh, decision making role right you basically listen to your uh, seniors the 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 lead of the tribe and you follow them right they have the most life experience that's a basic idea then um, the purpose of uh, sorry the presence of tradition such as earning a fair price fair wages ensuring a fair price fair wage ensuring fair price and fair wages because whether that community feeling is very strong in this economic system each member is a part of the community so no one tries to cheat no one tries to exploit each other they help each other and they uh, try to treat everyone in a fair way within a traditional system which is something which is a value we don't have in a modern uh, economic system it's a eat or be eaten kind of a situation greed plays a big role in modern economic systems uh, it's always a competition amongst people but in a traditional system there is no competition amongst them because everyone is uh, trying to have because property is equally owned land is equally owned everyone has a role to play everyone is trying to do good for each other and build up the community right traditional system then the young generations follow in the same professions and vocations of the elder generations and ancestors right so that's it. that's how they maintain the tradition if your father was a farmer most probably will become a farmer if your father was a hunter hunter gatherer gatherer then uh, carpenter carpenter likewise right uh, or had a different skill then that skill is what you will take forward that's how the knowledge is passed on the traditions are passed on right uh, and finally uh, why don't we have traditional economic systems today in movies sometimes you guys might have seen in those hollywood western movies they show you know the wild west and the indians and you know in their tents and they sit around you know smoking a pipe with the feather stuff and all that those are traditional things no traditional systems right why don't we have those today but there are tribes are there but but why don't why doesn't a country follow a traditional system because the traditional system has collapsed has failed for the main reason that traditions are very inflexible when the times change when the society changes when the needs uh, when the uh, perception the thinking the the wants of the society keep changing right the traditional system is unable to adjust unable to be flexible that inflexibility of the traditional system now for example if there is a tribe of people they have always done paddy cultivation uh, but when the water dries up when there is not not enough rains they are not flexible putta to go and cultivate something else maybe the young people in the tribes come and tell the elders okay why don't we grow something like corn or why don't we go into uh, animal husbandry or you know why, cattle or whatever it is why don't we do something different they will say no 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 we are always paddy people for generations and generations we have been paddy people so they don't want to change so when you are inflexible that is the beginning of the end and the tribes break up and people look for different ways of solving problems and uh, the system collapses system completely uh, fails okay so that's what we say uh, the values decisions and other traditional beliefs in such a economic system represent a high degree of inflexibility high degree of inflexibility the reason why we don't have traditional systems today okay right then today we talk about something called the new traditional economy your examiner talks about something called a new traditional economy so i want you guys to quickly write a small note right uh, on this area new traditional economy uh, so when we talk about a new traditional economy uh, i didn't use the word modern because i don't think the word modern and traditional can be in the same sentence but I, it's two opposite things so i thought of using the term new traditional economy there is a reason why we call them traditional there is a reason why we call them new let's explain both right uh, basically the first part right that is the first para is trying to explain why we call them uh, traditional the second para is trying to explain don't do that i'm just <laughs> right uh, it's explaining why we call them new traditional why don't you guys quickly write this then i can explain
Right. So <clears throat> when we look at um, a new traditional economy, uh, first of all, first of all, why do we refer to them as a traditional economy? Because they make all their resource allocation decisions, or they make decisions about production, uh, choice of techniques, distribution, right? Based on a very strong uh, cultural framework that is built based on their religious and traditional values. So they use a very, very strong cultural framework and within that, only within that frame, Buddha, they make their decisions. That frame is made of out of their traditions, their cultural, religious values. Within that, they make decisions, right? But even though they have this very strong cultural framework within which they make decisions, which makes them a traditional economy, they are open for dealing with being a part of the rest of the world, being a global citizen. They want to learn and somehow find a way to incorporate new and modern uh, technology into their system. They're not, they are that inflexibility that traditional economy had, that unwillingness to change, that this new traditional economies don't have. They are flexible. They want to change. They want to learn new things. They want to become a part of the global economy. That is the second part. That is what makes them new traditional economy. On the other hand, contrary, contrary meaning um, uh, against some, against the belief, right? Contrary to popular, so we say contrary popular belief. That is, most of most of us think about something in a certain way, but the actual thing is the opposite. Opposite is the word, right? Uh, on the other hand, contrary opposite to a typical traditional economy. Contrary opposite to a typical traditional economy, the one we learned earlier, these countries are highly driven by modern technology. They are willing to change modern technology and show a preference to be global citizens, deal with the other countries in the world, not close them up and say, no, no, our tradition and us, that's enough for us. No, they are willing to deal with the other countries. Most economies seem to be governed by religious law. Most of these countries seem to be governed by religious law. Your examiners go into a lot of details, but this basic idea is enough, right, for us. Uh, examples are countries like Iran, Pakistan are good examples for new traditional economies. New traditional economies. Okay, right. So now we have got the traditional economy part covered there. Um, so I'll stop here because this is a good place to start next week's session where we remind ourselves about the uh, institutional features one more time so that we can really go into learning incentives and then also go and talk about a market economy and a command economy. With that, we can learn about a mixed economic system. Today, we did, I think, two very important things with that. One is we talked about uh, the way you look at the future, the way forward in the future, uh, after your all results, right? How you process that in your mind and how you uh, move forward and do well in advanced levels, right? I hope I gave you enough confidence that you have, uh, you're doing the right thing and you have chosen the right things as well to go ahead and uh, do well in your A-levels, right? So again, let me remind this to you, especially when you go and talk to your friends to join our classes, virtual or physical. Uh, this is a very, very important point, I believe, uh, more than anything, to give you confidence about the program, right? Even I realized this recently because we went through a, uh, re rearranging of all our uh, result sheet files and everything <laughs> that we have in our office, right? We, we are putting it into an Excel sheet to keep make sure we have those information always with us in a digital form. So when we were doing that, we realized we have an unprecedented, un unexpected number of A-grade passes, so which made me realize that if you look at all the batches I have done classes for now and who have done the exam and got results with that, uh, you are part of the class in, in Sri Lanka, in Colombo, for English medium economics that has produced the highest number of total A-grade passes up to now. So I think that should give you guys some confidence, right? And our focus is also that, right? Second thing is, uh, we did this because this is the base of the entire economic system lesson, how we classify economic system. We took time here because it's so important for us. 
to learn economic systems properly. Right. So those two things we have done with that. Um, yeah. Yes, sure, brother. You mean this slide or this one? Which slide do you want me to show? This or this? Okay, now let me know. New traditional economy, right? Okay. Right. New traditional economy. Okay. Then, uh, yes, Shehla, there's another question. Let me answer quickly. Um, uh, just a fair warning, Buddha, the next installment of our, you know, uh, the fun thing about life in Sri Lanka, the power cut, uh, will happen any moment. So, fair warning. Right. Uh, so, it says, um, so, can you please share the previous slide, new traditional economy, uh, to take a picture because I couldn't copy it. All oh, right, right. Okay. I think some of you guys have had problem with this slide. All of you can see the slide now, I am sure. Right? Uh... Ah, right. Um, Asna, I hope I said your name correctly, Buddha. Uh, so welcome to the class. I hope uh, you were okay with what we did today. Yes. Things made sense. Okay, right, good. Then Buddha, what you do is, I'll just write a number, okay, on the screen now. It's there on our website, website also. Uh, just WhatsApp or call this number, right? It's our WhatsApp number as well. And uh, anything you want to know, any guidance you want when you make payments on the website to collect the study materials, everything Buddha, you can just uh, call uh, the, this number, one of the coordinators, right? We have two coordinators, one technical coordinator and one, uh, one admin coordinator. Both of them will be ready to help you. Not triple seven, two double seven, seven two nine. Okay, this is our right uh, WhatsApp number as well. Just call this number or WhatsApp this number, right? Uh, if the WhatsApp doesn't work, call. Uh, talk to them. They will guide you step by step. Yes, Deepthi, you have asked a question. Uh, Asna, I'm hoping you're okay. Yes, right. If you want, if you have anything to ask about the subject, Puta, right? Uh, you can talk to me after the class, okay? That is also okay, provided the power doesn't go off, right? Okay. And uh, remember, there is a recorded version of all the sessions I have done and I will be doing in the future. It's in the website. You can watch them as well. No problems there. Uh, Deepthi, your question. What is uh, intellectual property? But the intellectual property is basically something innovative, something, some kind of a innovation, some kind of a mainly invention that someone has done. It could be a, a technology. It could be a new machine. It could be a new uh, uh, management theory, a thought, a idea. It could be a new concept. Anything if someone has thought using our thinking ability. So intellectual property can only come from humans. Intellectual property, right? It's someone's original thought. That is intellectual property. Then uh, there are ways we can protect it and we can uh, commercialize it, buy and sell it. That's where we talk about things like getting a patent license for a new technology copyright for some publication, some book, right? Uh, if you have some, um, uh, if you have released a song, if you have released a movie, if you have released some work of art, something creative, you can take uh, royalties for that. You can ask other people to sing. You can ask other people. No, in Sri Lanka, we don't. But uh, normally in a developed country, they should do these royalties. Now, if, if I'm a singer, if one of my songs is played in the, on the radio, Right? That radio channel, each time they play the song, they have to pay me something because it's my song they are playing and earning money from it. That's called intellectual property. Is that clear? Yep. Right. Buddhi mea depola. Okay, intellectual property. Uh, in Sri Lanka, of course, the IP laws, intellectual property laws, uh, are not that strong. So nothing can be really protected. Even these slides that I am using, 
someone can uh, you know get the if they can get a pdf of them or whatever the way if they can get them uh, they can use them and do classes or whatever they want because there's really no way to protect it in our country but in foreign uh, in, in advanced economies not foreign countries advanced economies intellectual property laws are very strong right so that's that but i think we are okay so let me officially conclude the class if you guys have anything to ask clarify until the power goes off i am available okay right so until next time stay safe and uh, stay motivated let's keep doing good work